He's a filmmaker, photographer, published writer, naturalist, and co-founder of Running Wild Media. He earned his BSc in biology at Bowling Green and is currently earning his master's of biology at Man Miami University. He has years of international wildlife field research and formal and informal teaching experience. He combines these fields with media to enhance science communication. His love for nature and passion for the outdoors has brought him to some of the most extreme habitats on earth to film critically endangered wildlife. Justin is a 2017 Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leader, a Nat Geo Wilds Wild to Inspire award-winning filmmaker, member of the Explorers Club, and on and on and on. So welcome, Justin. Uh, uh, Justin, I hope you didn't uh, hide your video. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. All right. So the rest of us are going to turn our videos off for Donna's instructions, and I'll turn it Okay, we have some people that still have their video on, like Sherry, Phyllis, Tom, Nancy. Could you guys turn your videos off? It's in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Tom, could you turn your video off? Tom? You're muted, Tom. On the, on the bottom left hand of your screen should be video and then mute. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks guys. I really appreciate you guys inviting me to talk and allowing me to kind of share some of the projects that I've been up to and how photography is being used and some of the field projects that I'm working on. Um, but yeah, let me share my screen. Share. You guys can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. All right, so like they said, my name's Justin. I'm a wildlife photographer. This, this first image is kind of a cool image. It is a uh, brook-eyed tree frog. And this animal is critically endangered in Costa Rica. And they're kind of succumbing to habitat loss. Uh, climate change is causing that as uh, the temperature changes, the cloud forests are receding in Costa Rica. And so this, this animal lives in a very, very small habitat there in, in Costa Rica. So it's really hard to find and kind of difficult to get into the area that they're found in. And so I was really adamant about finding this animal because I really wanted to sort of document it and share its story and tell its story. So I went out with some conservation biologists and we had to lug all the camera gear up, up cliff faces, slippery cliff faces. It was it was insane. And so after about three to four hours of just hiking around and trying to listen for the calls, going to all the habitats um, that this animal would be found in, because they, they like to lay their eggs next to um, the spray off of small waterfalls and stuff. So we were checking all the streams and all the waterfalls we possibly could. Um, I was absolutely dying because it was hot as hell. <laughs> it's Costa Rica, of course. And so it's really, really humid. And I was, you know, just dying in the heat and about to give up. And we were kind of like thinking about packing it up and everything. Um, and then this thing just started hopping around um, in the treetops right next to us. And we literally were scrambling to get all of our equipment together because we kind of started packing things up. Um, but luckily, this animal was a really, really nice subject. And he kind of stuck around for us for a little bit. And um, we got to spend some time taking photos of them, but we only, we limited our time to, you know, maybe five minutes and then we had to move on because we didn't want to expose the animal to too much nighttime flashing and everything. So I took two or three photos and um, we had to move on. But it was, it was really nice to get this image because then I can go and I could tell people about the animal and share its story 
and we used the image to show some of the locals in the area that this animal exists and it was part of a broader education push so that people can understand um, what this animal is because it lives right in their backyards but people don't really know about it and so that was one of the nice things and that's that's kind of um, a story that is exemplary of everything that I kind of do and how I use photography so with that being said We'll kind of get into what I do currently. So right now I am the director, partner, and co-founder of a production company called Running Wild Media. And this production company is entirely focused on wildlife and conservation filmmaking and photography. So what we do and what we specialize in is going out and finding really difficult animals to find and photographing them and taking video of them, and sort of crafting the story around whatever that animal is to then use that to the public, you know, the people, the stakeholders that are in the area. Um, and so throughout the presentation, I'm gonna share some of those projects that we are currently working on um, with Running Wild Media and kind of the future of what that looks like. Um, another thing that I'm doing right now is I am, I just got a new job uh, three months ago. I'm the International Communications and Outreach Program Officer for an organization called Planet Indonesia. And oddly enough, they're based out of St. Louis, but they operate in Borneo. And I've gone out there a couple times, and I'll talk about that later on in the presentation um, to work with them. But that's kind of an exciting opportunity that I have now to kind of increase the impact that I'm having with conservation, education, and outreach. Um, and I think it was said earlier, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a biology student at Miami University, um, and that's been a really exciting program. Um, focusing on community conservation and how to integrate education and inquiry-based education into um, communities so that they can learn about the ecosystems and the wildlife around them to better the planet. And so quickly, I'm gonna give you a timeline. Um, let's go up, my computer froze. All right, so this is kind of interesting. So. This timeline kind of shows how the world has changed since I've been born. And the percentages reflect the amount of biodiversity left on the planet. Um, and this information and the data that I got for this came out of the WWF report that just come out in, um, I think it was a couple months ago. And so the data, there's, there's a couple things you have to keep in mind with this data. Um, we didn't really understand what biodiversity was or what it, what it meant until about 1970. So this data assumes that 1970, we had 100% biodiversity. So anyway, in 1991, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. I was actually born in Riverside. We had 61% of all the biodiversity on planet Earth within the last 100 years existing at that time. And then in 2008, I started a really cool program called the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium School, where I actually really, really fell in love with filmmaking and photography. Um, and that's kind of where I decided I wanted to take my career in that direction. And so this is a unique program through the Delaware Era Career Center where students can take two years of classes at the Columbus Zoo. And the students are doing research, we're doing field work, we're learning all about zoology and research and organic chemistry and everything. And so that was a really cool way for me to challenge myself outside of a normal high school classroom and kind of push myself into doing something that's a little bit different. And that's where the seed was planted, I would say, where I'm on this path of just being obsessed with finding wildlife and trying to protect it in any way I possibly can. And at that point, we had 37% left. So between when I was born and when I went to Columbus Zoo School, we lost a significant amount of biodiversity on this planet. And then in 2014, I graduated from Bowling Green State University. We got some people here who lived in Bowling Green and visited Bowling Green. That was a really cool program that I went there. I got my degree in biology, but I studied marine and aquatic science. So I worked in the marine lab. Um, Bowling Green had a marine lab, which is really cool. Tons of fish and all sorts of animals that people can work with and use for educational purposes and research purposes. And that's kind of where Running Wild Media was born. So I met a guy who um, was studying film production 
And I wanted to do both biology and film production, but I was told by my advisor that that was absolutely ridiculous and that would never work. I'd be there for six years. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So I just did biology, but I did all, all kinds of extracurricular activities. One of them being a grant that was offered through Bowling Green called the Givens Memorial Fellowship, where they give $6,000 to students who want to pursue a side project or a side quest of something that they couldn't do otherwise and that it's non-academic. And so me and this other guy, we went down to Costa Rica to film a wildlife documentary. And while we were there, we realized that we could do something cool and create this company where we basically just do that. We go around, travel, film wildlife, talk to researchers and scientists, tell their story and then get that information out to the public. Because we believe that there was a huge divide between what the science community was doing and what the public understood. You know, scientists kind of stay in their labs or they stay in the field, they write their papers, and then they move on to the next thing. But recently, there's been a really big push for scientists to communicate more. And so with that, a lot of grants and things that scientists are receiving require them to do some sort of educational outreach program. And so that's kind of where we fit in. We fit our company in to go on expeditions and go into the field and everything. And we have that science background, which kind of is convenient for us and convenient for them. So that's where that started. And when it did, we were at a third of the world's biodiversity. And so today, 2020, I'm giving this presentation to the Westbridge Camera Club. And we're at a quarter biodiversity. And so the reason why that's kind of scary is because I'm, I know all of you guys know about it, but biodiversity is important and it's a good measure for the health of the ecosystem. And biodiversity really forms the web of life that supports everything around the world, including our society, our agriculture, um, our resources, things that we take advantage of. Without the biodiversity, those systems start to collapse. And so seeing the difference between when I was born, I'm 29, we had 61% biodiversity and now we're at a quarter biodiversity. It kind of shows why I do what I do. You know, it's, those numbers are alarming. You know, they're, 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 they're the reason why I do this. And so it's not all bad news. Biodiversity can recover. And there's a lot of areas where there's been good research that has shown it can recover. The Marshall Islands being one of those places. And so I firmly believe believe that we can go back to that area and I think we can do it very quickly. And so kind of what motivates me is the idea that our society could come together and could start building smart cities and start protecting and preserving biodiversity and really rebuilding what was lost within the last, you know, 30 years and create a much more sustainable future. And so one of the projects that I want to talk about um, is the American red wolf. And this is one of those animals that really fit into that biodiversity conversation because it is an apex predator. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm not, I'm not gonna open it up now, but maybe when we do Q and A's, I'm curious to hear how many people have actually heard of an American red wolf because they are a very elusive and not understood animal. This is, a unique species. It's not a gray wolf. It's not a coyote. It's, it's its own species. It was found from eastern Texas all the way to New York. And this animal was the top of the food chain. It was regulating all of the, the food web on the east coast. And when colonizers came in the late 1700s, early 1800s, they started eradicating the species to the point where in 1980, they were declared extinct in the wild. And they, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife had to pull the last remaining red wolves out of the wild down in Louisiana and start captive breeding programs to save the species. And in 1987, they were brought back from the point of extinction and they were released out into the wild and they exist in a very small area today in North Carolina. And right now, there's about 17 to 20 of these animals left in the wild. So it's an extremely small population. It's not viable at all, which means that they're forced to, forced to interbreed or hybridize if they are to survive. 
And so a lot of work is being done to protect the species, but there's also a lot of opposition to the species. Um, a lot of people still believe that the red wolf is going to huff and puff and blow their house down or eat their children or attack all of their dogs and livestock, which is simply not true. This animal actually has never killed a single person on record. And so it's a very misunderstood animal, but for some reason it's receiving a lot of backlash for it. And so that's kind of where we fit in. Uh, we were tasked to go out and find this animal by an organization called the Conservation Centers for Species Survival and the Columbus Zoo and the Wilds are a part of that organization. And basically they oversee the recovery program, which U.S. Fish and Wildlife is a part of. So we went out and we filmed the program to try to build the film. And we shared the film uh, beforehand, so some of you guys may have seen it. Um, but that film was a result of us going in to try to create an education program, a cohesive communication project so that we can communicate to locals and people who live within Red Wolf Range or in possible future Red Wolf Range to communicate to them the importance of having this animal on the ecosystem, how to live with the animal, and um, try to clear up some of that misinformation that has led to this animal's demise over the last few decades. And so we started off by going to some of the managed care facilities across the country. This photo was actually taken of an animal that was in a managed facility, but they are kept in huge enclosures and they're meant to stay extremely wild. And that allows for the opportunity to have them rear young naturally so that those young could potentially be released out into the wild or if the wolves are being transferred out into the wild, they can be. And so this is at the Point Defiant Zoo. They have a huge site that's off site um, where they breed a lot of these animals for the recovery effort. And so after going into those managed facilities, we went to the field where these animals are found. And in order to understand where they were, we had to set up a system of trail cameras. There have been a lot of photographers who had gone out to try to find this animal, but have been unsuccessful because they hide like crazy. They hate people. They don't want anything to do with you. And so if you pull up in a car or you're out walking around, they run, they know exactly where you are and they run away. Unlike the gray wolves out in Yellowstone, which kind of do their thing. And so we set up a whole system of trail cameras when we first started to get an understanding of where these animals even were. And I know they've got radio collars, so that's the thing that's around their neck. And so US Fish and Wildlife biologists had a general understanding of where they were, but it was really hard to pinpoint these animals using radio telemetry because they can travel kilometers at a time. So we started it off in an airplane to try to coordinate where the animals were, but on the ground, it was extremely difficult. So by setting up trail cameras, we were able to sort of decide where the behaviors were, where they were concentrating and go from there. And a lot of what our trail cameras caught was some really unique behavior. And the cool thing about this was we were able to contribute to US Fish and Wildlife's general understanding of the distribution of these animals and their behaviors. And I'm gonna show a quick video here um, about our reaction to one of, to a sequence that we caught on a trail camera. Okay, so we're in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge and we had just checked our trail cameras. Uh, and Alex is going through the footage right now. Looks like we got some deer running by. This is like the most active camera and trail spot. The deer is one here. Oh, the wolves are running. I wonder if they're going, they're going the same direction that deer just went. <laughs> He's got something in his mouth that looks kind of like a leg. Dude, they're <laughs> Dude. <laughs> now they got something for sure. I think they got the deer. Is that the head? Oh, it's got one antler. Oh my God, <laughs> they killed the deer. That's that is so, so cool. Oh man, there he is. Now well, poor deer, but it's got a whole pack of red wolves. <laughs> that is so cool. That's amazing. So that was cool to be able to show um, their hunting behavior. No one had ever caught wild red wolf hunting before. And so that was the first time people kind of, I mean, it, 
you know, it's not as good as we'd like it to be, but it's still something. It's a good baseline to understand what hunting looks like for red wolves. And so once we kind of set these cameras out, we left them out for a couple months, and then we returned several months later to try and film the animals in the wild for the first time. And we spent 11 days out here camping and driving up and down every day, all day up the the roads here, we would spend hours in the morning and in the evenings and blinds overlooking some areas where we had determined that they would be. Um, and 11 days, we only, we finally found them on the second to last day um, where they were just crossing a field. It was really misty. It was kind of rainy. And we were able to film them um, for about 10 minutes. And we have a whole behind the scenes video about that that I could share with the group at the end. Um, it's about five minutes. It shows like everything that we put into the program and finding these wolves in the wild and finally being able to film them in the wild. And so as another part of that story is we went out to St. Vincent, Florida and we documented the first transfer of a wild red wolf in over a decade. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife hadn't been releasing any wolves out into the wild because it was still considered an experimental population, which they violated the Endangered Species Act, which caused a lot of political issues. Um, so that's why there wasn't any major releases over that period of time. But the biologists on the ground and the guys who are really kind of pushing this program have done an amazing job at pushing this project through and allowing for this, this transfer. And so this is 2282, this is a male red wolf that was released earlier this year out in North Carolina and was paired with a female who they were hoping that they would get together and hopefully produce some um, puppies in the landscape. And this is 2282 out in the wild for the first time. He's got that radio collar, and you can kind of see the field, and that's the North Carolina habitat out there. Um, this is the first time this animal has stepped foot in North Carolina after being transferred from Florida. And this is kind of the first step in the recovery effort where they're gonna start releasing wolves fairly regularly in this area to hopefully build up that population so that they can start, um, start expanding into other areas. And so the important thing about this is that these red wolves really do help with disease control and they help control a lot of the animals that over, over exploit the ecosystem like deer. There's a lot of deer in the area and they tend to eat a lot of the plants and that changes the dynamic of the ecosystem. And so having these wolves on the landscape really does bring that ecosystem back to center, back to balance. Another thing they do is eliminate a lot of the invasive species such as nutria that are out there that are a pain uh, for agriculture because they go out and they dig a lot of the crops and these wolves will take care of them. So having a healthy population throughout the eastern coast of the United States is really important for maintaining not just, you know, the beauty of nature, but it also is really important for maintaining the function of these ecosystems. And so moving forward with this project, we are working with PBS Nature to do a series where it features us as filmmakers, myself and my business partner, going out and trying to continue documenting um, this program and to show what goes into it. We're gonna be going down south to do some more research on some canids that possibly might still be out there. We'll be looking for lost red wolf populations in the south, as well as covering the um, additional releases of more red wolves into this area. And so the importance of that, like I said before, is to communicate to the public just why these animals are important and to build public support to prevent them from really putting a hold to this program. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to share the Red Wolf story because I think it's a really important story. And I think people need to understand that this animal is a unique species and it is incredibly important for the ecosystem. So moving on, there's another project that I was a part of that I'm really excited about, um, some marine science programs. One of them being, I went on an expedition with the California Academy of Sciences. And so we went to a place called Fernando de Noronha in Brazil. And this place is an entire marine protected area that allows some 
very limited fishing around the, the outskirts. And so what we were doing out here is we were looking for new species. And I went out with the team to document um, their research, the new species, and put together a communication package so that the people on the island could see the animals that exist around their, their island. And so they understand what kind of animals that need to be protected with further fishing closures, limited fishing, and marine protected areas. So this uh, top left is a drone shot of just some of the beaches there. You can see the reef, you can see the volcanic mountains there, um, some wildlife that we encountered while we were doing our dives. But the main focus of this was to do some deep sea diving. And so the team wore these rebreathers, which allowed them to go down to 500 feet and collect fish and invertebrates that may have never been seen before. And so um, this is the equipment here. This is what it all kind of looks like. This is uh, them underwater with all the equipment. They have literally four tanks on them. And they're all backup tanks at certain depths in case something happens. And then these are the collection jars that the team uses in order to, to collect the species. So this is a French butterfly fish, but this is the first record that this animal has ever had around this island. And so that's a... Uh, uh, another shot of it. And then we also partnered with a lot of the universities around um, Brazil who came in to do a lot of genetic work on these fish. And the overall goal was to understand how the deep mesophotic reef interacted with the shallow reef. And it was thought that they were almost two completely different or ecosystems where the shallow reefs are succumbing to a lot of issues with climate change. Um, the temperatures are causing coral bleaching, ocean acidification from CO2 being absorbed into the ocean, um, rising uh, sea levels because of ice caps melting, which is causing desalination in some of these habitats. And if you think about it, coral are basically just really thick water. And so they, they have a problem dealing with those sorts of uh, changes in the, the habitat. And so it was thought that these existed in two completely different areas and that mesophotic reefs would be protected from climate change. But because of the research that um, the California Academy of Science is doing, we're understanding that they are very much connected and these deeper reefs, which seem to be more stable, are just as susceptible to climate change as shallow reefs. In fact, when you go to these deep reefs, you find pollution, you find tires, you find fishing line, you find nets, you find you know, soda cans, the same stuff you would find in the shallow reefs. So being able to show that these areas need protected is important because it allows for the establishment of additional marine parks in these habitats. Because currently there are very, very, very few mesophotic reefs that are actually protected. And so putting together um, this package, this communications package that documents what's going on and showing the species that we're finding out here and the adverse effects of climate change really gets people like um, political figures and governments to understand that what they have is special and what they need to do is to protect this ecosystem if they want to continue having secure fisheries and um, secure economies, that these reefs and these ecosystems are extremely well connected to their economy and it's important to protect them. Another cool program and another video that I want to show you, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but it's a, it kind of goes along the lines of communication and showing the importance of reef ecosystems to communities. This is a 360 degree show that we did for um, an island in Honduras called Roatan. And we worked with the Roatan Marine Park and Kodak Pixbro to make this happen. And so basically what it is, is, it behind, or is you get to experience what it's like to scuba dive with us. Hello guys, thank you so much for diving in with us today. We are here on a beautiful reef off the coast of Honduras. Now in front here, you'll see an amazing hawksbill sea turtle laying on some coral, eating a sponge. You'll also see some angelfish hanging around as well. The reefs off the coast of Honduras here provide amazing habitat with all sorts of sea turtles, including the most common inhabitant, the hawksbill sea turtle. The hawksbill gets its name from its sharp, protruding feet. 
to bite and crush food. Huxville sea turtles love shallow reefs where they can find lots of food like algae, crabs, and fish. Oh, look at him. He's so close. And so uh, the rest of the episode kind of goes on like that. We just talk about sea turtles and why they're important and everything and things people can do who live in sea turtle habitat uh, to protect these animals. Um, kind of like the red wolf, you know, they're an important animal on the reef. They prevent the overgrowth of sponges and algae that kind of smother coral if things aren't going so well. And so having a healthy, robust sea turtle population like hawksbills is important to maintaining the health of the reef. And this was kind of cool because what we did is we loaded these videos up into 360 VR headsets and we gave them to the Marine Park and they facilitated programming so that visitors and locals could put these headsets on and see what it's like to dive with a sea turtle. And we are live talking or talking while the action is happening during the series. And so we have communication helmets that allow us to do that. So you're getting kind of an understanding of, you know, what we're feeling, how we're reacting and what it's like being in the water while things are happening, which kind of gives a unique experience um, and helps connect with the host um, versus other virtual reality platforms, which is basically all um, just narration. And so this program was rolled out in Honduras, like I said, but also in parts of Ohio. I did bring it back to Bowling Green and implemented the program in the marine lab and in several of the biology classes, which was kind of fun. So we did five parts of this series and currently we are looking at building this up through a National Geographic grant to film more in Honduras, as well as expand into the Florida Keys so that people can really understand, you know, what's beyond their shore and if they can't scuba dive, feel what it's like to scuba dive get an understanding of what science career or marine biology related careers are out there and really connect with the ocean, but ultimately think about how their behavior is, you know, impacting the ocean around them. And then the final point of the education program is for these stakeholders to create their own conservation strategy that they can readily implement into their communities. And then this is some work that I've been doing, this relates to my job with Planet Indonesia. When I first started working with Planet Indonesia, I went out there to help document their smart patrols. And so for the first time ever, they were using something called smart patrol, which is essentially, they're using GPS units, and cameras and data sheets and a program called ArcGIS, which um, is like a computer-based program that is used for mapping and everything so you can better understand what pressures are affecting the the ecosystem that you're hoping to save and so i went out with the first smart patrol i wrote a grant uh, to help them i was a part of a team and this was the emerging wildlife conservation leaders um, that was mentioned earlier in my bio um, we our, our team wrote a grant and i went out to help document what they were doing and we encountered a lot of weird stuff like it was it was kind of eerie being out in the jungle um, there were traps every 15, 20 minutes of hiking. We would see traps meant for pangolins. We'd see snares that were meant for clouded leopards. We'd see sticks that were bent over with glue that were meant for songbirds so people can go out and take them and sell them in the illegal market. We also saw a lot of slash and burn and we saw some illegal farms out there and everything. Um, but it, it was a little bit eerie uh, just because the forest was fairly silent. You know, you, you usually hear a lot of hornbills, a lot of gibbons, um, and the people out there um, were doing that out of necessity. It wasn't necessarily they, you know, wanted to, they didn't hold anything against the environment. They were just trying to make a living. And there's a lot of, you know, social inequality, income inequality that is affecting a lot of these rural communities. And so you, these smart patrols go out there, they document what's happening, they remove the traps to help with the wildlife, but a huge part of what they do is they serve as ambassadors for the rainforest around them and they work with the local communities and support the local communities. In fact, two of these people in this photo are community members that were hired specifically for this program. And so it was really cool to see the program start and it's now expanded into a lot of different areas in Indonesia. 
um, some mangrove ecosystems, some mountainous rainforest ecosystems. And the communities that this program is really supporting is astounding and the wildlife that they're starting to see once again in this area is incredible. One of the animals, uh, helmeted hornbill, after starting this program, a helmeted hornbill started nesting within their um, patrol area and they guarded that helmeted hornbill and made sure that it was nesting okay and everything. And um, they're starting to see a lot of increased helmeted hornbill activity. Another thing I did with them is I went into a couple of the bird markets and documented some of the birds that we saw. Uh, the bird on the right here, it's a fairy bluebird that is illegal to be traded in the Indonesian market, but that was in um, this particular bird market. And so what they do is it's, it's really, for cultural purposes, they really enjoy having songbirds. They've been doing that for a really, really long time. So it's not necessarily something that's bad about the culture. It's just gotten to the point where the habitat and the songbird population has been restricted and fragmented so much that it's really starting to have an impact on uh, these animals. And so what Planet Indonesia does is they have a team that goes out and they look into these markets and they look and they do their market surveys to determine what animals are being traded. They also do a lot of public education and outreach to show people what actually is legal to trade and what's not, because a lot of the times people don't understand or they don't know what animals are illegal to be trading. And so that education has really helped uh, the people who are, who do legal businesses and have pet markets and everything uh, to understand what is okay and what's not and to help support these wild populations um, so that they can start gaining again. Planet Indonesia also has a songbird rehabilitation site where they take animals that were confiscated from um, these types of illegal situations and rehab them and release them back into the wild, which is really cool. So while I was out there, obviously I'm a wildlife filmmaker, so I tried to document as much wildlife as I could. So these are just some of the examples of wildlife that are in areas that the um, Wildlife Protection Unit works in. So this top left is a young female proboscis monkey. Um, the bottom is the angle-headed agama. It's the boat build. Kingfisher on the right, and that's a black-sided uh, frog there. The foot flagging frog, which is pretty cool. They'll stick their feet out and they'll attract mates that way. But one of the coolest encounters that I had when I was out there is with the uh, orangutan. And so they, Planet Indonesia is working in an area now that has the largest, most robust orangutan population, um, born orangutan population in the world. There's about 20% of them that live out there. And so it was really, really cool seeing these animals in the wild. They were very, very curious and very interested in what I was doing. But, you know, the key to the getting a good photo of these animals was to just be quiet, move slow, stay crouched and just kind of let them settle in and act normally um, and they did you know they I was in an area where they had seen people before and so they were pretty used to it they were protected not all areas orangutans are protected but in this particular one they had certain legal protections that allowed them to sort of habituate to people so that was kind of nice it's um, around Camp Leaky down in Tanjung Puting uh, southern Borneo but being able to see you know, these, these incredible animals and just kind of like look into their eyes and see like the emotion that they're feeling and the things that they're doing. It was, it was really cool. And then being able to settle in with um, this female, I'd actually spent a lot of time with this female um, before I was able to get this photo because she was, you know, climbing around in the trees, um, kind of hiding her baby. And I just sat there for about an hour and eventually she turned around and honestly just like posed. <laughs> I don't know if you can get a better shot than that. The animal just kind of opening up, showing me her baby. She never looked at me. She kind of always gave me the side eye. So I never got like a shot of her looking directly at me, but she really just kind of relaxed and allowed me to take the photograph, which, you know, is an important uh, lesson because really the best way to get a wild photo is to keep your distance and be respectful. You know, one of the things that really bothers me is I see a lot of photographers and um, people go out there and they try to touch the wildlife or they try to get too close to the wildlife to get that, that viral video or that viral photo. 
a lot of really big names in conservation do that. Um, and it's kind of, it has a very negative impact on wildlife to where, you know, you're freaking them out, you're causing them to drop their food, you're changing their behavior in a way that's unnatural, which, you know, later on could potentially impact their, their long-term survival. And so these orangutan photos, and I guess all the photos that I took really, really spoke to that by just being quiet, being respectful. And if the animal's done, just letting them go, not pursuing at all. And I was worried that I wasn't going to get any good orangutan photos, but you know, it just took a little bit of time, a little bit of patience, but I was able to get some really good photos. And then quickly, I'll talk about some other projects and then we'll do some Q and A because I'm tired of talking. I'd want to hear from you guys. One of the cool projects I did this year was cover the Florida grasshopper sparrow. This is another animal that is critically endangered. There are less than 50 breeding pairs in the wild. At least there were at the beginning of the season. But I worked with an organization called White Oak Conservation. That is also part of that organization I met, I mentioned earlier, where they're working on breeding animals and managed facilities so that they could be released into the wild. And so this animal is an integral part of Florida dry prairie. And of course, they've been succumbing to habitat loss and pollution and all that good stuff. Um, also, high amounts of antibiotics in their nests due to the amount of antibiotics that are being pushed into our agriculture in terms of like cattle and things like that. So this animal has seen a drastic decrease in their population recently, but Working with these organizations, um, I helped create a lot of good PR for them and also documented some of the grasshopper sparrows in the wild, which the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and White Oak and various other organizations used to be able to work with their stakeholders, show the stakeholders that these animals are in the area and kind of tell the story of the importance of this animal. The last project I'm going to talk about is this one. I just did it like two weeks ago. So I basically documented, and this was kind of a biodiversity science project that I did. Um, I looked at biodiversity between a wildflower habitat and a lawn habitat. And it should go without saying that you would expect to see a lot more stuff living in a habitat that has tall plants, lots of flowers, um, but I hadn't really seen anything that really, really showed that. And so what I did was I went out with a sweep net. I selected several sites, both lawn and wildflower, and picked a grid, did all that good stuff, sweep net, and then documented the animals that I encountered out there and compiled this image, which basically shows the biodiversity in a wildflower ecosystem versus a lawn ecosystem. And you can really see there's a lot going on with the wildflowers. There's a lot of species interaction. And this is just looking at macro invertebrates. Now, if you think about the animals that these macro invertebrates support, like small mammals, small reptiles, birds, um, that becomes a, a, an exponential amount of biodiversity that you're finding within those wildflower areas versus what you would find in a lawn ecosystem. Mostly it's grasshoppers and leafhoppers and a house fly <laughs> that I caught. And so this was a really cool way to visually show, you know, why it's important. And so the intent here is, and this is kind of an ongoing program, is that showing people who have lawns that if you convert just small sections of your lawn to wildflowers, native plants, that you could support a habitat that resembles something on the right or the left more so than what you see on the right. And if you want to build a cohesive and sustainable and eco-friendly world, you're going to have to do what's on the left. You're going to have to put out wildflowers. You're going to have to convert some of that lawn away from lawn and into more habitat, native habitat and wildlife friendly ecosystem. And so that's a picture of me in the field with my rig. I used a probe lens. I figured you guys would be interested since it's a camera club. I had flashes on the bottom and the top to kind of give the animals depth when I took the photo of it. And I used that Lewa probe lens. It's a 24 millimeter lens, uh, wide angle, uh, to get really up close to the subjects without disturbing them. In fact, I could be about three feet away from the insect. So I'm not breathing on it. I'm not moving it. 
and that's what allowed me to get some really good images because they were kind of chilled out a little bit they just sort of sat there in fact it was kind of interesting a lot of the insects when i put them on the, the little glass plate there they just sort of sat there and were confused as to what was going on instead of trying to try to take off right away i did miss a lot of a lot of insects there's I did catch a lot that you don't see in that photo because immediately they just flew away. But for the most part, I was pretty pleased with how they reacted and how I was able to get the images because of that lens. And then the last thing is something I like to do through my company at Running Wild Media. We do wildlife photography tours all around the world. Uh, but the focus of these tours is to get participants to work with researchers. So we use the relationships that we have uh, working with research facilities all around the world and um, we stay very cheaply and they usually allow us to participate in their field work so it gives our photographers and the people who come along with our trip um, a really unique opportunity to see research and wildlife research and science in the field document that and kind of build up their own pro portfolios in conservation communications and yeah so this is kind of the um if you guys want uh, more information on any of this stuff my instagram's there uh, running wild media is the name of the company so you can find us on facebook on instagram and our website is there as well as uh, the website for planet indonesia if anybody is interested in learning more about that organization as well Thank you so much, Justin. Um, should we go ahead and open it up for questions? Anybody that w has anything they want to ask you, feel free, guys, to turn your videos back on and unmute yourself. <laughs> Don't forget to unmute yourself if you have a question and, and uh, whatever that you want to talk to Justin about. OK, my name is Jim, and I have a question. Do you know Ron McGill? Have you ever met him or seen him? I've never met him, but I have seen him. <laughs> I mean, he's one that you might want to contact because I know b &H Photo puts on these programs twice a year. And of course, Nikon, they use their ambassadors to give talks. And Ron happens to be a Nikon ambassador. And um, he's hilarious to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> and very, very knowledgeable. You know, he's right in your line of work. So, I mean, he's been all over the world. Uh, just a fascinating gentleman. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely want to meet up with him or talk to him at some point. Um, that's been on my bucket list, but I haven't had the opportunity. Justin, hi, this is Rick. Um, how do you finance everything? <laughs> you've, got, you've got your travel, you've got the trips, you've got the equipment. Uh, anybody that comes with you, you know, a fair amount of money involved in that. So what, where does your financing come from? That's a really good question. So most of our financing comes from the client. And so we, we operate as sort of like a production company would, you know, like if you're, if you want a commercial, you hire a production company to do it. Um, but we exclusively work with conservation organizations. So a lot of the times we get financed by those organizations um, to go out in the field and highlight their work. Um, other times we write grants to cover some of what we do because the organization can't pay for that because they're, all the money that they have is going towards field work and working with their communities. So we do get grants occasionally that help finance some of that. Um, and then with the trips, the people pay to go on the trip and we use that, some of that money to be able to finance a project to help a conservation organization that we're working with um, to kind of like move that money around in a way that it works for everyone so that we can continue doing our communication and our conservation work that we're hoping to do. Um, it's taken a little while to get to that point. When we first started, we were spending our own money to go travel and find stuff and tell stories. And then, you know, after about a year of doing that, that slowly turned into us breaking even. And we did that for a couple of years. And, you know, at least your trip's covered and you get to do some cool stuff. Um, and recently, within the last two years, I'd say it's really turned into us being able to kind of eke out a living 
in doing this. Um, but, you know, I'm also working for Planet Indonesia, so it's not like totally self-sustaining, but we're getting to the point where I think it can be. Okay, it's good. Multiple sources for sure. Yeah, yeah, we're trying to diversify that as much. And we're also, we're hoping to create a nonprofit section of our organization where a conservation project or organization would be able to apply for a grant for, from us where their reward would be a full scale um, communications blitz where we would do a film, we do their education programs, we build them a website, we do all that kind of stuff um, pro bono for them so that they can get the, the communications that they need because a lot of that is really important for these conservation organizations to operate. We'd be able to provide that for them but breaking that economic barrier that's preventing them from being able to access that. Absolutely. Thank you. I have a question. What kind of trail cameras do you use? So we use a lot of different trail cameras. One of them we call the boom box. It's a Cognacy's. I don't know if you guys have heard of Cognacy's. They're based out of Traverse City, Michigan. Um, they create this whole system of like infrared sensors and flashes and it's it's built into a pelican case and you could put a camera in there and so we used uh sony dslr cameras inside that to get some footage but we also use moultrie we use bushnell we you kind of use what we can get um, a lot of the cameras we use were provided to us by the endangered wolf center um, which is based in St. Louis, which is why I'm in St. Louis. My fiance is a zookeeper at the St. Louis or the Endangered Wolf Center, which is kind of cool. Uh, she works with red wolves and Mexican wolves and Maine wolves. But it depends on what we can get our hands on. Now, what about the drones? Do they disrupt uh, wildlife like the wolves you were talking about? Yeah, we haven't been able to use the drones we actually don't really use drones to get wildlife behavior because it is very disruptive. Um, they don't, they know it's not a bird because it's like whizzing and lighting up and flying around erratically. So they kind of react to it. The only way that we could probably, and we're going to try this for our series PBS is we're going to try to use a thermal drone where we can go really far up in the air and kind of almost get like a helicopter eye view of what's going on in the ground. Um, otherwise, we kind of avoid drones because it puts a lot of pressure and kind of makes things weird for the animals that we're trying to work with. We, we typically use drones to get faraway shots and just um, environmental landscape shots. Justin, what photos did you have in, in, in the exhibit that was up at the McConnell Art Center? So I had a lot of some of these photos were there, um, but I also had, I don't know, it showed a little bit more of my portfolio, but each of the photos at the McConnell Art Center had a story. So it, each one was going to have like a little QR code that you could scan and connect to a film. So we do lots of films and lots of stories, and each one has a very unique conservation story, whether it be, you know, the people who are working with it or our quest to find it. Um, that's my fiance, by the way, <laughs> is in the background. This is my friend, Johnny. I went to zoo school with him. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Just calling it out in case you see like random people walking around in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let that wine go to waste. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was a, it was all, wildlife photos all depicting unique programs and animals that are endangered in some way of extinction and the purpose of the the gallery was to really connect people with their stories and then what could be done locally and globally to help protect these animals and preserve them for the future is that online anywhere that we can have it um no okay <laughs> <laughs> you could but go it to might the be a good idea. Yeah, you could go to the website, our Running Wild website, and see like all the films and stuff that we've been up to. There is an online interface that I developed for the McConnell Art Center where you could interact with all of the photos. Uh, but I didn't pay for renewal, so that website is currently off offline right now. Um, but when the when the McConnell Arts Center Gallery comes on, I will have that website up and running where you could see all the images and everything that would have been there. 
Thank you. Justin, you mentioned you released a red, red wolves on St. Vincent, Florida. Is that on the island? Yeah, so they have, they have a population on that island right there. Cool. And there's one breeding pair. And right now, there are three juvenile wolves. And the idea is that that breeding pair every year is going to have a litter of wolves. And when those wolves are about a year old, they'll move them to North Carolina. Do they swim? They theoretically can. <laughs> yeah, mainland, that, mainland's not that far away. Right. The, that's why the young have to be removed from the island at about a year old. Because with the dynamic of a wolf pack, when they start getting older, they get kind of chased off to form their own pack. Um, and so when they do get a little bit older, the mom and dad are like, okay, it's time to get, and the only place to go is the mainland. And so they do, they do move them. Were they there when the hurricane hit? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They are, they're considered and managed as a wild population. And so when the hurricanes do come through, they are just left to the elements and as far as I know, they haven't had any issues with that in the past. Yeah, that area got hit pretty hard. Yeah. Well, thanks. Great presentation. Well, thanks. Yeah, it was a very good presentation. I'm surprised no one's asked me what camera brand I use. <laughs> well, now that you've asked. Go ahead. You mentioned it. What, what do you guys think I use? Canon. Um, Nikon. Canon Nikon. <laughs> I use Sony. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah, I use Sony um, because of the video capabilities. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we when we, go out, when we go out into the field, we have to be able to shoot really high quality photo and video. Um, I know the photo isn't as I like the look of Canon. I have no idea how to use an icon. I've never touched one, um, but. <laughs> I like the look of Canon, but with the video quality of a Sony, we had, that's where we go. Um, but we're also kind of dabbling into the world of black magic. I don't know if you guys have heard of black magic. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, it's a competitor to red camera. I don't know if you guys have heard of red. Mm -hmm. it's we video. Use black, yeah, black magic is a lot smaller and it also has a better, just it does better in the field. I know a lot of reds kind of, freeze and they like forget what they're doing sometimes and there's been a lot of complaints with reds not being able to handle temperatures so we're using black magic now uh, but sony and black magic is what we use for the films and everything i was going to ask a question about the red wolf um are there still red wolves uh, populating the uh, smoky mountains still there are not um that really? pop that population actually ended up dying out because of hmm. a virus that's entered that population. <laughs> so, and there was a lot of pushback there. And so they didn't release, they didn't keep that, pro, that population up. So the only existing population right now is in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. Interesting. Yeah, only confirmed, there may be others, but we're gonna find them or look for them in our PBS series. <laughs> so okay. stay tuned. Okay. Okay, the volunteers that go on your trip or the participants that go on your trip and participate in some of the uh, the research, how long are the trips and about what is the average cost or it depends on where you're going? Yeah, so the average time is about 10 to 14 days. We try to make it so that you know, people can use vacation time. It like, we, we always schedule them. So it's like over, you get three weekends, one in the middle. So it like kind of works out. Um, and the price, it does, it does depend on where we're going, but we, we keep it really, really cheap. Um, Cause I, our guides are usually people that we work with and are friends of mine. So they're not charging us premium prices to like guide us around. Um, I drive the whole time. I even drive a stick on the other side of the road and through jungle or up rocks if I need to, uh, through sand. So we cut, we cut costs a lot. Um, 
And, you know, usually we get free places to stay when we meet up with these research stations because they're excited to have people there. They're excited to have volunteers, extra hands to help them with whatever they need and the publicity that they get out of it. So we went to Namibia last year and that total cost was $2,200 plus airfare. So It's not the worst. I've seen worse. <laughs> Absolutely. So besides your ability to take pictures, what all types of research do you have the participants do? Um, so for Costa Rica, we worked at a marine rehabilitation park. It was the only rehab center in Costa Rica. And participants got to work with uh, some of the turtles that they had there, some of the sharks that they have there, as well as work with some of the systems. Um, a lot of, some of it was like feeding and doing medical checkups and helping out with that. Um, we did some unique research in Monteverde where we set up mist nets in the rainforest and we were catching birds and we were banding birds and measuring birds and, you know, participants got to hold and work with the birds and um, got to learn how to ban the birds and we're checking mist nets and setting up and tearing down the, the mist nets. Um, we also did some reptile and amphibian surveys where we would go out and we would, you know, catch frogs. Um, participants learned how to manage handling amphibians out in the field. We didn't touch any of the reptiles because half of them are venomous in Costa Rica, but we pointed at them and said, yep, that's a snake. Um, so that's pretty sure that's what we did and then in Namibia we did some we worked at a rehab center again um, we did some data collection on rhinos we did some rhino tracking on foot which was pretty cool we got to see black and white rhinos without any fences without a vehicle on foot we tracked them for a couple hours um, collected the data the individual and stuff like that so we had a bunch of trips planned for this year but <laughs> that didn't happen so they got I'm not totally sure when they'll be, but the next trip is looking like Indonesia, which is really convenient because I work for Planet Indonesia. So um, going to find orangutans, working in some of the project sites, setting up trail cameras, looking for some really unique hornbills um, is on the, on the slate for that trip. Thank you. Are those prayer flags from Tibet? They are, yeah. Cool. My friend gave them to me. That's how you're supposed to get them, I guess. <laughs> it's like, it's it's better if you're, they're gifted to you. But yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got some random things around here. I'm actually in a camp on the outskirts of St. Louis. Yeah, so it's interesting. My fiance wanted to be a keeper, an animal care specialist. And so we moved into a camper so she can get various jobs uh, to just kind of like build her career. So she, we started off in Florida. She worked at a facility, White Oak, which is who has the uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows. Um, and then we just moved around and now we're here in St. Louis and she got a full-time job. So we're currently looking at putting down some roots here in St. Louis and selling the camper and buying a house here pretty soon. But it's been great living in it because it's allowed me to travel and see a lot of really diverse places and cover a lot of really unique stories along the way. Right. Did you say you work with the Center for Biological Diversity? Or do you uh, we, we haven't yet. We are in talk, we're working with Smithsonian. No, we haven't yet, no. Okay. It was Conservation Centers for Species Survival. Okay, I got it. I was just Googling red wolves and their page came up and it says that uh, the Trump administration, and this was 2018, is declaring open season on America's last red wolves. Yeah, they, um, what that was is they removed some of the protection on the red wolves. Right. Um, and allowed people to hunt them very briefly. It was like they tested the water and allowed people to hunt them when they were off state land and on private land. Um, but that ended very quickly. 
Oh, good. Okay. And so, I, I don't see anything after that. So I was wondering what happened. Yeah, so they are still 100% protected under the Endangered Species Act. You are not allowed to shoot them on or off state land. Um, a complication comes in where for a long time, local landowners were allowed to hunt coyotes because coyotes are becoming an increasing issue on the East Coast. I'm sure you guys are aware, but coyotes are really native to the Southwest. They don't really belong over here. Um, and because the red wolf populations have been decreased so drastically, coyotes have been able to move across the country and kind of fill in that niche. And so they're becoming an issue. They don't eat the same foods um, as red wolves do. So they're kind of changing the dynamic of the ecosystem. So local landowners wanted to be able to manage coyotes on their property and they were granted permits to do so, but they were also allowed to um, shoot coyotes at night and it's very difficult to determine what a red wolf is and what a coyote is in the middle of the night through a rifle scope. And so they were having some uh, gunshot mortalities with red wolves that way. So they've restricted that program as well. Uh, so they're kind of rewriting some things right now to help bolster the population that exists in the wild and prevent the new releases from encountering any issues in the future. So they've rewritten that and now they're kind of like stepping up the game and making sure everything's gonna go smoothly for the future. And part of that issue was, you know, when they released the animals initially at the end of the 80s, they didn't really communicate with anybody as what they were doing. It was just like one day, a bunch of red wolves were on the landscape and local landowners, as you would expect, were a little bit distraught, a little bit concerned about having these red wolves back on the landscape. And so now that they're doing more releases, they're really, focusing on that communication strategy and getting positive press out there and films out there and like going door to door and telling people about these animals so that they don't encounter the same resistance that they did when they initially did the program. But some of that resistance is still, you know, may, remains throughout um, the last decade because those people who were there for the release are still there um, with these. So the communications really is an important factor for helping them get over that. Okay, thanks. Other questions for Justin? Oh, good presentation. Yeah, okay. Great thank you. Thank you. It was Justin, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excellent, thanks so much. That's a cool little hand clap emoji thing. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, outstanding. Uh, Donna, do you have anything you want to say to end the meeting or? No, just anybody else have anything that need? I think and we'll. Any discussion for our photographers on how we can do conservation photography? Sorry, what was that? Any suggestions on, for our photographers on how we can do conservation photography? Like where do we get involved or what's, what's the best way to, for us as normal people, not running wild people. To get involved <laughs> in conservation people. photography. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... Kathy is doing conservation photography, but locally in um, nature preserves. Yeah, I think the big thing about nature photography or what conservation photography is, you know, focusing on the story that you're trying to tell with the photo or what's going on with the photo. I mean, like everything, every photo I take, it's got this insane elaborate story behind it, which you know, being able to capture that and be able to convey that um, with the photo or with the supporting story or however you guys feel more, most comfortable um, doing that. I feel most comfortable through video and writing articles and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how I help tell that story. But really, you know, getting involved with rehab centers and researchers and stuff in the local area, they love having... Um, photographers and people come out and everything. Um, so what we've been doing a lot lately is connecting with a research organization or someone who's doing some wildlife conservation and then pitching that story to a magazine or an outlet so that that would be able to pay for the work to be able to cover the research. So for you guys in Columbus, 
there's all kinds of conservation work being done with the Ohio State University. There's a lot of professors who have labs who are doing a lot of great work, even local to the area that would be more than happy to have a photographer come along, document what they're doing, and then turn that into a public outreach where you could write an article or you do a photo essay and have it published in a magazine or something like that. So that's something that's like really immediate that you guys could do if you're interested in kind of filling that conservation science communication space um, and really kind of building that portfolio. And that's what we've been doing. We're looking, we haven't done a lot yet, but we're looking more into like Ohio based magazines because my business par partner is still based in Toledo. And so there's a lot of stories that are going on up there. He just uh, met up with um, some researchers up there who are doing Sawet Owl banding on Kelly's Island. And so if you guys just start kind of just looking, connecting, I know the Metro Parks have a lot of stuff in Columbus that they're doing. Uh, if you just email them, email the researchers, be like, hey, I'm a photographer. I'm interested in what you're doing, following along. Um, that's really a good place to start. And then connecting that back to a magazine or some outlet that you can put that out to, to really tell that story of what's going on. Great, thank you. Cool, well, thanks guys. Um, thank you, Justin, appreciate your, your time tonight. Yeah, and Roberta, if you wanna give out my email, if you can, if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything or. Okay, um, yep, I, I sure will, I'll send it out. Uh, to the club. Cool. Anyone else? Thank you very much. It's great. Thanks. Have a great evening. Thank you. Have a great Good luck with all your evening. research. Yeah, you take care. Thanks. Good to see everybody. See Bye. You week, hopefully. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, Justin. Bye, Bye Dima. Uh, see you guys. Thanks, Justin. Yep, thanks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Good presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Justin, I might connect with you later about like helping our group maybe get more focused if you don't mind. Yeah, no, that would be great. Okay. Because we have, we have started, but then, you know, in February last year, we started getting people together to go out to some of the preserves that the organizations I'm with, but then COVID came up yeah. and kind of stopped for a while yeah. so now, and it started again now that people know how to prevent you know getting sick and still maintain their distance and all of that we can still get outdoors just have to do it a little bit more safely so yeah if you could help us in some ways I'll put together some questions maybe and then get in touch with you yeah that would be great and I can recommend some organizations that would be good, you know, that would probably be open to having some people go out and document their work. Um, I got a grant through the Ohio Biological Survey, which is a huge organization full of like researchers, Ohio-based researchers and organizations who are doing some really cool stuff, mm -hmm. looking for cave salamanders. I got my grant to go look for mud puppies in the Maumee River. Oh, wow. Um, so there's, I mean, there's lots of lots of species in Ohio that are endangered and there's a lot of really unique research programs going on with them. I don't know if you guys know, but Ohio is the freshwater mussel capital of the world. I did not know that. More species of freshwater mussel in Ohio than anywhere else. And so like the Ohio State University and the Columbus Zoo do a lot of work with breeding mussels in managed care and then releasing them out into the rivers like the Cider River and Olentangy and everything. So. And there's there's a lot of a lot of cool programs that you guys can get in touch with that I think they would be more than happy to have you guys along. Okay, I know I worked some with Kelly Capuzzi and Laura Hughes. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Laura's into a lot of insect, um, mm -hmm. and Kelly's freshwater, you know, fish or and mussels and things like that. Mm -hmm. And she's done a presentation for our group. But yeah, that'd be perfect to get some more ideas because people are really eager to get started and I'm just not sure you know how to how to get that organized so 
Yeah, and it's it's nice to go out with an organization because they typically know where the things are, mm -hmm. or they have radio callers on them, or they have VHF signals on them, or GPS units on them, or something. There's some field site that they could take you to be able to find some of these things. And so being able to do that, you see the subject, and then you see their work, and it just makes the process a little bit more streamlined. Yeah. I did go with Laura to... Um release an Allegheny wood rat and that was really neat because I never even knew they existed before I went with her so yeah. Yeah. once you start doing this more and more you'll find some animals that you had no idea were a thing yeah I'd like Over to find dark. out more about bobcats in the area too yeah I did a whole survey with trail cameras so like my background is wildlife biology and science and so I a lot of what I do when I do photography, I kind of come at it with like a, a scientist sort of mind. Mm -hmm. Like if I need to find an animal and I don't have a researcher, I'll go through the literature and I'll find the sites where the animals are and like kind of build that, build, build that up. But I did a whole trail camera survey and looked for bobcats in Northwest Ohio. Oh wow. Like 50 trail cameras between Southern Michigan and Northern Ohio. So that wow. was exciting. It sounds like it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your presentation a lot, I'm, like everybody else does, and thank you so much. Yeah, I look forward to uh, your follow-up email, and we'll definitely get something going. Okay, thanks again. Take care. All right, see ya. All right, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. See you guys soon. Good night, guys. Bye. <laughs> <Hi. laughs>